have your Bible, Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 19. We'll begin there. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 10. And I don't know, I, I know it was in the early service because this was here when I started today, but bacon soda. Y'all get your fixings, right? Thank you. I uh, appreciate that. Somebody got me a shirt that says, my favorite essential oil is bacon grease. I love that shirt. And uh, I get compliments all the time about that one. Uh, anyway, thank you for uh, that uh, gift. And I'm sure I will drink it as soon as I can handle 15,000 grams of sugar. Okay, so I got to make sure I got a time to do that. Hebrews chapter 10, <clears throat> verse number 19, where we'll begin this uh, morning. And just by way, um, before I forget about it, uh, Bible school this week, we're going to try to keep that bottom parking lot for the vehicle, the bu buses and the, the transportation vehicles. So if you're coming and you're staying, you can park over in the bottom lot or in the, the big lot uh, towards, not big lots, okay, don't go shopping over there, but uh, the lot towards Culver's would uh, be just helpful. And, and if, you're, if you're doing something downstairs, we understand, but uh, you can park along the road there on that lot. But just trying to keep that as... as uh, uh, free of cars and, and chaos so that the drivers can get back and forth to pick up and drop off kids there. Hebrews chapter number 10, and then uh, also the teens are going to be going off site, so there's an extra permission slip for them. Brother Will's got a bunch of those if you are planning to come with kids, teenagers. <clears throat> they're having a vacation from Vacation Bible School. Isn't that cool? They're going to be going off site for uh, some of their events. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness... To enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another. Uh, to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Let's uh, be seated. We'll bow to pray. Father, I bow in front of you and thank you for the opportunity to um, proclaim uh, the name of Jesus. Lord, to preach the verses in this chapter. God, I, I need wisdom and I don't have it. I lack it. Lord, I pray that I would not be in any way a harm or a hindrance <clears throat> to the, the growth and to the, um, uh, the journey of, of people who believe and trust in you. Lord, help me to be a blessing, a help, a provoker, if you will. And uh, Lord, if any of those things happen for your name's sake, I want to give you praise ahead of time and uh, ask that you'd get all the glory. Thank you for those planning to get baptized today, decisions of obedience and submission. We pray for the week at hand, and we rejoice over victories this last week too. In Christ's name we pray, amen. There were um, a number of people that called the Lord this week on visitation, passing up flyers, uh, uh, one at church on Wednesday night. Hallelujah, man. Love to share those uh, stories. And, and we don't have our baptism up yet. It's, it's amazing we got a puppet show before a baptismal show. I just, just let that be said. I don't know how that's working out in the theme, theme of heaven. But anyway, uh, we're going to baptize over here at Quality Inn right behind the Marathon Station as soon as service is over. Get a, a few minutes for people to get out of traffic and get over there and, and assemble. And so just if you'd like to watch that and witness it, and we hope some folks will, to be an uh, encouragement and a blessing to those who are getting baptized. If you can uh, spare a few minutes, I promise I'll be quick and there won't be another sermon and there definitely won't be another offering over there, okay? But uh, we'll uh, baptize uh, today and rejoice with those that are making that decision to follow the Lord publicly and a uh, great, great day in the church. In this passage... Uh, we're going to get to verse 24 and 25, and if you've been in church long, the, the, you probably recognize that's a verse on going to church, Hebrews 10, 25. <clears throat> it's in the bulletin every Sunday in the church I grew up in. I didn't memorize it, but I saw it there. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. And we'll get to that point, but let's look at the passage at hand. Verse number 19, there's boldness. Boldness to enter into holiest by the blood of Jesus. That, that phrase or that um, uh, reference to the holiest is a picture of the holy of holies. In the Jewish tabernacle, later their temple, there would be uh, two places that were not to be taken lightly. The holy place 
which would be where they would do daily sacrifice uh, or daily prayers and the priest would go in to make sure the candlestick was lit and the, uh, uh, the altar of incense was burning. <clears throat> there also was a table of showbread in there. And uh, boy, like a little table of uh, showbread from Texas Roadhouse about right now, amen, uh, <laughs> thinking about that. Uh, uh, but uh, there's this table of showbread and David ate it and uh, I'm getting, I'm getting uh, kickbacks from every reference to restaurants I make. Uh, they're they're, they're going to sponsor our church, I'm sure. <clears throat> but in the holy of, holiest of holies, there was just a unique light. It was God's light. No artificial light. There was the Ark of the Covenant, and on top was that mercy seat, a picture of cherubim in there and on it. And that's where the high priest would go once a year to make the uh, atonement for the sins of the people. We don't have that now <clears throat> because Jesus Christ is our high priest. He entered into the real holiest of holies in heaven and offered his own blood, not the blood of another lamb, uh, to pay for our sin. It's because we know that we can have boldness that we're right. And I don't know about you, but if I don't know the answer, I'm not as bold as if I do know the answer for whatever I'm talking about. If I know what I'm going to say, I can be very bold and almost blunt because I know the answer. And I know you don't know it, so I'm going to tell you it. And uh, <clears throat> other times I, I would be less, um, I'm not, just less confident. And uh, I was talking to just someone out visitation yesterday, and I was asking, hey, you have children? Love to invite them to Bible school. No. And I said, oh, that's okay. Well, I'm just, just out and about. And, and uh, I said, do you go to church? And they said, no, I'm a, I'm a, a pagan. And <clears throat> I'm always curious to what that exactly means. And so I began talking. We had a great conversation. And she, in fact, she said, uh, uh, it was nice to talk with you, and I'm glad that, that you were nice and, and uh um, just able to talk back and forth. Um, but I, I'm confident, she said that, that they, she just believes in multiple gods, and there's just all kinds of gods. And I said, well, which one's the best? And she said, well, that's like picking which children you love the most. I'm like, well, I might be able to pick that in certain days. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, said, I said, which one's the best? Which one's the strongest? And she, she didn't have an answer. And, and I said, well, what do you think about Jesus? And she's, oh, he's a good prophet. And I'm like, oh, okay, now I got her. Now I'm bold. I know which direction I'm going. Because I can't talk about every other God in the whole world. I don't even know who they are or who's the best or who's the strongest. But once we got down to Jesus, I could say, well, do you really think he's a good prophet? Did he rise from the dead? No, I don't think he did that. And I said, well, it's funny. Uh, how, he, how could he be a good prophet if he lied about his identity yeah. and about his death and resurrection? That'd be a pretty crummy prophet. And it gave me a chance to, to witness to her. And, and I didn't convince her, but I sure tried to give some thoughts. And I can be bold in something that I know about. You want to talk John Deere tractors? Bring it on, baby. Bring it on. I can be bold about it. You want to talk about construction projects? I ain't going to say a word. <laughs> Plumbing, electricity, windows, uh, HVAC, uh, flooring, no. No, 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 no. I'm going to exit the building very quietly. Boldness is from a confidence. And what it's saying is we can go into the holiest boldly. No one went to the holy of ho holiest of holies. The, only the high priest once a year. He didn't go there every day. How could you go boldly? And the answer is by the blood of Jesus Christ. Right. That blood that was shed opened up all access to go directly to talk to God. In fact, it's called a new and living way in verse 20. I'm going to tell, tell you it's a better way. <clears throat> Not that the Old Testament didn't have its uh, purpose in time, but thank the Lord we're in a progressive revelation of God to man. Uh, we've got all the books of the Bible now, not just the, the first uh, uh, 39. We've got uh, the 66 collection. And, and what we see here is that now Jesus, as he entered in the world, his blood was shed. Now it's serious and it's, and it's settled and it's done. Whenever there's blood involved, things just get a little more serious. And you can uh, watch a, an athletic event, but once the blood comes out, uh-oh, man, we, it's serious. So with little kids, they fall all the time. Judson fell yesterday, slipped and fell, and knocked his noggin on the floor. And, and I, I knew, but I knew it didn't hit real hard, and, and he looked around, he cried a little bit, and then he was okay. But when blood's involved, it's all a different story. In fact, one of the kids uh, this last week this one fell. You've got to come quick, Dad. Hurry. I'm like, what? There's blood. 
It was a carpet burn, and there was a little speck of blood. But I get the band-aids, not the transformer ones. Get the good ones, and you know, go. it's all serious when there's any sight of blood. Now we, this is, I mean, call, call mom. I mean, call whoever. What's that number? Uh, 911. Call it, call it. You know, and when there's blood, then things you know that there's some seriousness to it. Look, if God just came and gave us a message and taught us about righteousness and showed us the way, that would have been true. But there was blood involved. Jesus became man and not just appeared as a man like angels appear as men. No, Jesus bled and died and rose from the dead. His blood is the confidence that he is our sacrifice for man's sin. See, sin would cause blood to be shed. Man will die because of sin. <clears throat> Adam and Eve's sin is passed down to all of us, and now we all face the consequences. Even the first family had turmoil and such that the one killed the other, as far as the brothers are concerned. What we see here is when blood is involved, it now is serious. Having, therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into holiness by the blood of Jesus. There's boldness, and it's by the blood. We can't say it enough. Do, why do you always talk about that? It, it, without... The, the literal physical blood of God being shed for us, we don't have access to Him. We don't have a payment for sin. From the very start of the Passover when Israel became a nation, a nation that was uh, uh, freed from Egyptian bondage, the Passover was blood shed over the doorpost and on the, uh, the, uh, the crossbar and the, and the, the sidewall the, uh, of, the, of the door to show <clears throat> there was blood applied and no need for the destroyer to come and enter into that uh, house. The blood of Christ is what gives us the boldness and this better way. And get down, down to verse 21. It says, we have a high priest over the house of God. Uh, we, we have a, a setup of church and government and self-government. We do believe in autonomous local churches. That is a big fancy word for each church is responsible to God. Uh, for their decisions and their direction. And obviously, God gave us a book to follow. Um, but I would think a church in New York City might look a little different than one in Marysville, right. just in practice and in all those things. That, that just makes common sense to me. Uh, even churches out in the country look a little different than ones in the city. Um, churches out in the country uh, oftentimes uh, don't have some of the, uh, the same concerns and, and the same um, situation, all those things. So in, in this uh, uh, verse, 20, uh, verse 21, it says we have a high priest over the house of God. Jesus is our high priest for any believer, the only priest for every believer. You do not need to confess your sins to me or any other person. You can have somebody pray with you, intercede for you, but Jesus is our high priest. Amen. Go to him with any concern and need first, and then come and talk to somebody else to get some encouragement or some enlightenment on something that you may not be able to understand from your high priest. But the Bible tells us that God speaks to us through Jesus in these last days. In verse 22, the, the high priest is over us, and then look what's in us. Let us draw near with a true heart, <clears throat> a true heart in full assurance of faith. Because we've got this blood and this boldness, we want to have full assurance of our faith. I just want you to take your halo off for a second, and I want you just to, you don't have to raise your hand, but if we were honest, you would probably have to admit that at some point since you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you probably had doubts if God was real, and you probably had concerns if you really should be in, in a church or in that specific church or all kinds of things like that. In fact, after this message, you may have questions about ever coming back to this church, okay? It, it could happen. That, that, that's, that full assurance is dicey because we are human and we have flaws and we uh, can be swayed back and forth. And I'm just going to be honest, <clears throat> we rely as a church upon God to change hearts and to remake hearts and to revive hearts. If that doesn't happen, we'll kill each other. Not physically, but literally, it, it would happen. We would devour each other, as the verse last week, bite and devour. We have to constantly rely upon God to do this. So in verse 22, we should be drawing near because this new heart's in us. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. That's that, that fallen nature. And our bodies washed with pure water. 
It's not talking about a baptism, uh, but yet there is some ceremonial cleansings. And I believe that our spiritual body needs to be washed with the water of the word. And so our flesh gets stuck and gets situated in this life sometimes. And the word of God is the agent that which he would wash us. And it says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. We can't wash our own sins away, only the blood of Jesus. But yet once we are saved, we do have the ability to confess and call upon him and in this flesh to have some clear conscience. Another way to get a clear conscience, and Peter, we talked about in Sunday school, is to be baptized. If you're a believer, you've been saved, you ought to follow the Lord in baptism. And so we would love to talk with you about it and explain it and show it. Like I said, after church, we've got some doing that. <clears throat> but it's an answer of a clear conscience to God in 1 Peter 3, verse 20 and 21. In verse 23, it says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. So you see, we've got boldness, we've got the blood, we've got a better way. Why would we ever waver? Well, unfortunately, it's because just who we are and prone to wonder, prone to leave the God that I love, the old song says. In Acts chapter 3, we've been doing this little uh, exercise of, of a chapter in, sun, in adult Sunday school class. Pick a verse out of a chapter and just kind of handwrite it and explain it and apply it to your own life. And <clears throat> I was looking at the verse in Acts chapter 3 where it says that they, re, they uh, refused the just and the holy one and desired a murderer. And I'm like, why would they ever have done that? And, and you know the story, they, they chose to release Barabbas instead of Jesus. And I, and I just, it, it, it just compelled me that later on that chapter, Peter says that, that they did this out of ignorance and there was some divine purpose in Jesus going to the cross. But I think in my life, I know who Jesus is. There's no doubt that who he is. When I choose something over him, how miserable. I don't even have the excuse of ignorance. I just have the explanation of rebelliousness. And I have the answer of my <clears throat> sinful decision to choose and pick something over him. Well, how do you get convicted of that? How do you get straightened back around with that? Uh, the word of God. But uh, I'm just going to be honest. When I, most of my years at church, my Bible sat in the back window of the car so I knew I could find it next Sunday morning. <laughs> I knew where it was at so I wouldn't lose it. And I need it when I go back to church so I can walk in with it. And I can sit with it and I can put my hand on it like it's my sword and my shield and my comfort. And then I'll set it back in that car window when I get out of church so I know I can find it the next week where it's at. I'm, just, I'm not accusing, but I'm just probably being a realist that most of us probably don't read a whole lot of our Bible on our own. Maybe we do, and I praise, praise the Lord if you do it. Thank the Lord. I think we all ought to. Y'all say amen. amen. And, we, and no, nobody reads it enough. How much you read it? We ought to probably read it more. But just, just out of statistics and, and, and surveys and those things, uh, people probably aren't going to convict themselves from reading the Bible. What happens is God realizes that who we are, what we're designed for, how we're wired. And look at verse 24. It says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. It's like God realized, you know, how, how would he ever do that? <clears throat> what we would need in order to stay in full assurance and stay bold and confident with the new living way that he's provided for us. Well, we just get it once and we're done. Yes, you get salvation. One dose is enough. But in order to uh, follow the Lord and to get right with the Lord on a, on a continual basis, He's provided this. This consider one another to, to provoke and to love and to good works. That word provoke, I think I know what that word means. I do have four children that ride in the back of a car. Amen. I know what the word provoke means. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a word that we would describe as poking or prodding or just... Just getting, getting underneath someone's skin. You're provoking me. Quit provoking me. But the word means to incite or dispute in anger to have confrontation and contention. Now think about this. Only two places in the Bible do we find this word translated this way. 
And I, I am uh, probably in the middle of two generations. Uh, folks older than me can remember coaches that yelled and screamed and challenged your manhood if you were on the team. I mean, I remember Bobby Knight throwing the chair across the court. Can somebody say, I mean, I was at a ref, so I understand a little bit. But he'd have, he'd have threw one at his kid as player, too. You know, he would have. And, and I, I remember that, that uh, coaching and that yelling and screaming. I'm telling you, preaching was just louder than Sunday school. That's what it was when I grew up. Same, same type of lesson, just one was louder and more animated and, and, and then the other. That's how you knew somebody was preaching. They started screaming. When it was Sunday school, they just talked. And that's how the difference was. I'm just teasing a little bit. But, uh, and, and now... My generation, and, and probably younger, <clears throat> that doesn't go as well as it used to. In fact, you're uh, not looked at with a lot of respect or intelligence if you're yelling and screaming, trying to get something across like that. Sometimes my kids will say, stop yelling at me. I'm like, you haven't heard yelling in your life. I promise you there's a lot louder than this. But yeah, I don't know what, I'm not trying to, um, to condemn, or, or I'm just trying to make some, just some honest uh, my opinions and assessments of things, <clears throat> but that word provoke, it has in it that in your face um, inciting or disputing in anger. Let me prove it to you. Look at the other place that's in the Bible. Go Hold your place here. Go back to Acts 15. It's not even translated with the same English word in the King James Bible, but <clears throat> the same underlying uh, root word, the Greek is the same. And it's Acts 15, verse number 36. And don't, don't think that you have to be a Greek scholar to follow Jesus and to learn the Bible. Uh, you don't. I, I just think that um, because it's available and I, I'm trying to, to be a better student, and there's some things that I've learned that have assisted me in preaching and, 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 and living and devotion. Uh, I, I love it when I go to the Philippines and met a guy named Cheeto. That's his name. I want to say goes crunch every time I say his name. And Cheeto drove a taxi uh, moped that would haul five to seven people, literally in a little motorcycle and a sidecar. And Cheeto had seven or eight children. And Cheeto would uh, drive that and hopefully make six or eight dollars a day in American money. And I remember when we were there, he, he would be back. We'd be door knocking and he would be back there by noon. And we're like, what are you doing? I thought you oh, I made my six dollars early. I want to go out with a church today. He, he, he just loved Jesus. Cheeto had a stroke and then became a preacher, or right before he had a stroke, was trying to preach and, and pastor one of the, the village uh, Bible study churches that were going on there. And, and, uh, and Cheeto, my goodness, I, I don't know how much knowledge he had of the Bible, but I know how much love he had for God Amen. and God's Word. And so you, you don't have to know. Knowing's half the battle, what G.I. Joe said. Amen. You, you can know a lot and not love Jesus. There's a lot of people that aren't in church that know a lot more than I do about the Bible, but they're not serving God. There's a lot of people that have, know, uh, have been taught Sunday school for years and not, not uh, loving Jesus right now. It's not your knowledge, but when you do know some things, it, I, I think it's a help. Look at verse 36. That was a long commercial to get you there. Verse 36. And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord. And see how they do. <clears throat> Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the provoking was so provoking between them that they departed asunder one from the other. That's the word. And the contention was so sharp between them. It made two preachers depart from fellowship because there was provoking among them. I'm just trying to show you that the word is not a comfortable, considerate, soft and peaceful world. Let, word, let us come together so we can all feel better about ourselves. Let's love and do good works. Maybe. If that's what motivated, but I'm telling you this, the word provoke means contention. It was so sharp that Paul and Barnabas split. Paul chose Silas and Barnabas took Mark. Thankfully, later on, you find that Mark must have made amends and Paul said he was good for the ministry. And that's another message on the time. I just wanted to show you that as we look at Hebrews 10, 
There is a call and a cause to get into someone's grill and provoke them, not for bad or for departure or for a, a separation, but look at go back to Hebrews 10. It's to provoke and to love and to good works. You got to provoke someone to love? That should just come naturally. No, the word is agape. It's a choice. It's a decision. And you need to choose to love the work of God, the will of God, and the word of God. You need to be provoked about that. And as I look at verse 24, it is God's uh, program or it's his strategy to keep our profession of faith without wavering. There is a strength and unity that comes when we come together for the cause to pro provoke or pursue the ordinances and the work of God. I hope you find friendship. I hope you find fellowship. But I really, those are secondary. I hope you find your faith to do something for God when you come into the church of the living God. I don't think the work is done just when you come to church. I believe that we're supposed to build up the believer so the work can be done outside of church. You ought to be a witness and sharing. You ought to be showing the Word of God and, and living it and, and lighting the way for somebody else to see Christ in you. <clears throat> this is accomplished when we provoke, incite, or dispute in anger and have contention to bring someone to love and to good works. The picture here is the picture of the church in heaven. Verse 25 says this, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. That phrase is not synagogue. It is episynagogue, which is only used a couple places as well in Scripture. And it's to denote specifically this was a, a coalition of Jew and Gentile together in one church. Boy, the Hebrews would have loved that message in the first century. You need to assemble with Gentiles. Are you kidding me? We never wanted to, and, we'd, and we, we, we were forbidden, and we never wanted to anyway. And yet the verse says, don't forsake it. It's God's will, and it's God's work that you and those Gentiles need to be one body. Wow. That's kind of... Now, today, we would think it would be so strange to even preach that. Well, of course we're going to all be together. We're Americans. We should be the melting pot of all different cultures into our country. You all say Amen. So when we try to, to hold back and keep all of our own identities that we lose our nation identity as one nation under God, indivisible, and all those things. I, not to get political or, or societal, but there are things at work that would love to destroy America. And one day, I'm sure it will happen when uh, Jesus takes a church from this place. Anyway, the picture here is of the church together. They're assembled together. I preach this I believe, last spring on a Sunday night, so most of you will not remember it. I'm just a bad preacher joke, but it was a long time ago. And I'll tell you the reason I preached it. It was right when the uh, pandemic began, and there were calls and, and, and to uh, not have church, and, all, and no one knew what to do, and all these things. And I read this verse, and I thought that word uh, assembling together was really important. And so as I looked it up, there's one other place that shows up. Go back with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And this is not a pat our back, we're a great church thing because we met during the... No, it has nothing to do with that. I'm just trying to tell you. I decided that whether I die or live, I'm going to try to obey God's word. Amen. And I don't... I, doesn't, I, didn't, I wasn't trying to, to begrudge or, or uh, belittle those that, that wouldn't come, couldn't come, whatever. I just said... The door is going to be open. I'm probably going to get it, and that's just the way it's going to be, and we're going to assemble. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, here's what it says, the same phrase and the same wording. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our what? Gathering together, gathering together unto him. That gathering together is the same as in Hebrews 10, 25. And my point is this. <clears throat> when the Lord calls the home, calls us home, the trumpet sounds, every believer will gather at that assembly. Yeah. If you're saved, you will not miss church that day because it'll be in the clouds. Yeah. There will be no uh, reason or excuse or anything away to uh, help uh, to cause us not to meet together. 
Now, in, in this day and age, there, there's all kinds, every, every uh, age. You've got sickness, you've got soreness, you've got uh, travel, you've got, uh, uh, there's all kinds of things. I'm not trying to preach against everybody uh, uh, that misses a church service. That's not my, my goal here. I'm just trying to explain to you that this not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together in Hebrews 10, 25, it's pretty serious that God wants us to meet together. Yeah. <clears throat> it's so serious that when you think about when it was written and how it was said and how it would have been received, it would have been a quite the statement to cause a stir. As I mentioned, pardon me, Brother Will gave me a piece of gum and I need to get rid of that thing, okay? I, I stole it from Will because my breath was about to kill somebody and now, <laughs> now my speech is about to kill me. Let me get rid of it there. When, when this verse was written, to uh, assemble together Jew and Gentile, and then not let anything hinder it because the day is approaching. We don't necessarily know which day it's uh, referring to. <clears throat> it could just be the day of death. And if that's the, tr the fact, all of us are going to die one day. Yeah. And we ought to meet together before that day comes. Yeah. Brother Larry Ray uh, is not well, and, and he was in the hospital late last night. Patty texted me. They got home in the middle of the night, and he's on hospice care. And Larry's just, uh, just uh, he's not probably prone for this world for very long. But the last few times I would talk to Larry, he'd say, I wish I'd go to church, preacher. Thank you for showing me how to watch it, but I wish I could go to that new building. I'd give anything if I could go to church. You know, we ought to meet together because there's going to be a day when we can't meet together. But the day of death, that happens, things of that nature. Could be the day of destruction. Literally, Jerusalem is about to be destroyed a few years from when this is supposedly written. I wonder if the Jews would have any excuse or any fear or trepidation by meeting together when the Roman soldiers are gathering, getting ready to burn down their city. They might have had a little bit of concern, but the verse was just as true in the first century as it is in the 21st century. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. Can I just provoke you a little bit? Can you imagine if you're standing in line at the judgment seat of Christ and you come up the elevator into heaven <laughs> and you're in line to stand in front of G the judgment seat of Christ and you're right behind a fellow from China who's had to meet in secret, who had to give up his wealth and his worth just to be named as a Christian. His family probably uh, rejected him, denied him, and he's been meeting in secret because of Hebrews 10.25 with the, the fear of all kinds of government intervention, and you're going to stand right behind that guy in the judgment seat of Christ. Growing up in Marysville, Ohio, and having every opportunity to attend church probably multiple times, one of the ladies after the morning service said, Preacher, I love Bible school. When I was a kid, my mom would look at the schedule, and I would go to Bible school every week of the whole summer. I loved it. I'm like, I bet your mom loved it too. She said, I just loved going to vacation. I just met, hit everyone in the town. And can you imagine standing behind this guy? Or how about, how about someone that uh, uh, was living in fear uh, of our identity in World War II and trying to meet? How about the people in the Dark Ages who were going to get arrested if they had a page of the Bible? And they're meeting together to read it and to sing hymns and to serve and worship Jesus. And they're, they're meeting together... Well, you don't have to. We don't want to get caught. We'll die. We can't spread the faith. If we're dead, we just got to, we can't, we got to avoid it. No, they're meeting together because Hebrews 10, 25 says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Can you imagine when you're in line? My name's Stout. My name's, where were you at? I live back. And I'm going to be right behind that person that goes up, casts their crowns. How'd you do? Well, uh. I met a few times, talking to a young fella, and, and I, know this, I know this young man has some interest in the things of the Lord, because whenever I see him, he'll come talk to me. Not, doesn't attend a whole lot of church, but I know he prayed and got saved, and I said, what are you going to get serious in church? Man, you know, preacher, I probably will sometime. I, I, I believe I probably will. And I said, well, when? What's going to put you over the edge? Man, I, you know, maybe I said get a little older, and I said, when you think it's worth it, that's when you're going to do it. Amen. He said, ah, oh. I said, yeah, you don't think it's worth it right now. You think it's going to hurt your life. It's going to take from your life. It's going to be too much to add to your life. It's just not worth you investing that time and that effort or changing your way so you don't feel bad when you come. Wow. So you say, man, I believe it. I'm just not. 
You know when you'll do it? When it's worth it. Amen. For the believer, it shouldn't be worth it in just this life only. If I got benefits every time I did something for God down here, who wouldn't do that? You know, I, I'm the preacher and I try to love and do good works, but really, I'm paid to be the preacher. You are just good for nothing. <laughs> of course, I ought to be. But when is the last time that I can write down some things that I was provoked to love God and to do good works just, just over and above? Or just not because I'm a, a pastor, because I'm a person. Not because I'm trying to get someone to my church, just because I'm trying to get some, do something good. Right. Listen, it, it, can you, if you wrote a list and can you write down, when have I loved something more of God than I have of my own agenda? Well, I love my kids, preacher. Well, they're your own flesh and blood. You ought to, you sorry thing. Right. People who don't believe in God ought to love their kids. Yeah. At least feed them once a week, right? I mean, you know. <laughs> When, when have you, could you write down, I've been provoked to love Jesus in such a way that I'm going to sacrifice or serve. It only happens when you're provoked in the assembly of other believers. You don't get that message watching Nickelodeon at night. You don't get that message watching ESPN or whatever the news store. What, no. It happens when we come together, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves, we provoke one another to love and to good works, and we need to be provoked. It's easy for me to read this verse and think, well, yeah, they should have met back then, but I'm glad they did, so I get the gospel. But at the time, it was probably very radical and very, very uh, over, over the top to unite Jew and Gentile, to meet in the midst of fear to have a copy of the Bible when it was outlawed and forbidden. Yeah. I wrote in the bulletin this quote in Vacation Bible School Week, and, and I, I remember this quote from many pre preachers have said it and I've heard it. <clears throat> it's easier to build boys and girls than it is to repair men and women. And so I thought, I want to see who said that. Just for my own knowledge, I'm sure it was some Baptist preacher, you know, got to be, and uh, uh, looked it up, and, and Frederick Douglass said that. Frederick Douglass was a man of faith, an abolitionist uh, before the, the Civil War, and spoke very, very boldly and very, very ahead of his time against the wickeds of slavery in America. He was asked to speak at a Fourth of July gathering in New York, and he got up, and he was an escaped slave. His name was Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey, and him and his wife, they changed their name Frederick Douglass, after reading a poem written by Francis Scott Key, I believe, uh, was the story that I, I, I learned. And in his talk, he began to speak, and he said about the, the, the nation, the 76th year uh, celebration of the 4th of July. <clears throat> and he said, 76 years is old for a man, but it's young for a country. We're really just an adolescent country, and there's still hope for us to grow and to become better and, to be, and, and change things uh, that were going on. He began to speak about the patriots of the day and, and, and how uh, there was, uh, w the, the country was great to have so many great fathers uh, of their history. And, and, and then he said, and here I am called to, to speak on your 4th of July, your Independence Day. And he intentionally said your three or four times. And then he said, let me freely speak. It's hard for me to celebrate it when we don't have freedom in this country. And he began to speak on the ills and the wickedness of slavery and how the church, not every preacher, but the churches were, were uh, uh, pushing it and promoting it because of the profits of the people. Even England struck down the ills of the West Indies slave trade before America did. Now, let me tell you this. He didn't say, burn down America. He didn't say, get rid of the flag. He didn't say that we're, we're done. No, he said, let's make this better. Yeah. And he began to quote the Constitution saying there's nothing in there that would artificially give rise to slavery. In fact, everything in there says we believe that we're all created equal with certain inalienable right. given by our Creator. So why aren't we practicing what we've preached? Right. Oh, it was outlandish. It was a, an article and a, and a speech given before its time, and people said, you shouldn't use this platform to say things such as that. 
he replied, as long as I can hear the cries and the screams of those that are being persecuted and their teeth knocked out with the whips and with the, with the sticks, I think I should talk about it all the time. Amen. Well, you know, we have a document that stood, this t- stood the test of time. Yeah. The Constitution was way ahead of its time when it was written, but the Bible has always been ahead of its time. Amen. And now it's even before its time because people now don't want to hear what it says saying it's archaic yeah. and that it's not applicable anymore or applicable, however you want to say that word. And uh, they'll want to say, let's get rid of it because we need to evolve in something better. No, I'll say it takes just as much courage to stand on what this has said than to try to go to something new. It's provoking. It's in your face. It's against the cries of culture and the rise of wickedness. And the same as that day when Frederick Douglass spoke up boldly and spoke, how can we preach the gospel and not free the captive? Oh, we see in these verses the purpose. It's a profession of our faith. It's the proof of our full assurance to meet together. You are here at church because you believe Jesus rose from the dead. Would you all say amen? If you didn't, why would you be here? Unless someone invited you to get a free Culver's card. Amen. But, you know, White Castles are coming. They're coming, I promise you. Just a few more visitors and we'll get the White Look, you, you, if you're at church, you have some, some assurance that you are following God the way that He is prescribed and put in pages to do. It's the proof of our full assurance. It's the progress in our Father's intentions. As it says, we're here to form a more perfect union, those original documents of our country. They didn't claim to have it all settled. In fact, there was a lot of argument on how to settle it. You had the New Hampshire plan, the the, uh, Virginia plan, you had Alexander Hamilton's uh, redo England plan. I mean, you had them all. But in this book, we have a progressive coming to perfection that God wants to conform us to His image. And wherever you're at is not as important as which way you're heading. And so the purpose of us coming together is to provoke and to prove and to profess and to progress. But it's predictive as well. Look at verse 25. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another... And so much the more as you see the day approaching. I'm not a linguist and I'm not trying to twist the Bible, but you know what? And so much the more could be referring to people missing. Just as much as so much the more we ought to meet as we get closer to the day of his appearing. I think that we ought to have church more than less because Jesus is coming again. I think we ought to have prayer meetings. And if you have a small group, as long as your group is group and small about the Bible, do it. If you have a prayer meeting and not a gossip meeting, do it. If you're having a Bible study or a discipleship, do it. Meet together about the Word of God. But I think we ought to do it more than less. Right. The idea of, of the, the emerging church is less church, not more of it. I guess that's the way they can get along. They just don't get around very much. Well, you get a good old uh, church that just settled in and going to do it. Well, you're going to have some fussing, some feuding, some fighting because you've got a bunch of flesh there. But I think we're going to be obedient. And I'd rather be obedient than get the result I'm looking for. I might not get what he's looking for. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner some is. You see, it's predictive. It's pointing to the day that's fast approaching. And then finally, let me give you the problem. Here's the problem. Verse 25 says, there's a manner of some that just aren't going to meet. They're not going to assemble. Maybe it's fear of reproach. Maybe it's fear of persecution. As we had last year, I'm not against what happened. I'm just, no one knew. And, and there's some concerns. Uh, what, what would man give for his own life, Job says? And there's quite some uh, uh, truth in that. But whatever would hinder us from meeting together, the problem is they weren't meeting. Fear of reproach. Maybe they felt free from the need of the ordinance that they had already had accomplished. I've already been saved and baptized preacher. I don't need to be a part of anybody else's. I don't need to do that. I've got it done. Maybe they found something that's captivated their thoughts and their their, uh, intrigue more than the church has. Maybe, just maybe, the problem is not some other thing, but the problem is that They're not coming because it's fully disclosing who we really are. 
What do you mean by that? Would you hold your place and go with me to the book of Jude, right in front of the book of Revelation? It's a little book. We got some of them light bulbs that you can talk to the, the government PSYOP uh, Alexa in your house and tell them to turn them off or on. I don't know if you got any of those light bulbs. And we were naming them light one, light two, and this room, that room. We got, they, I, I think we confused her. She didn't know which one to turn on or which one to turn off. So we changed the names to Jude and Revelation. Matthew and Mark. We, I mean, we got all the lights. Are Bible. Turn on the light. We got a Bible name. And <clears throat> the book of Jude is a little book. And just, just a, a moment of, of laughter there. But verse 17 is where I want you to look at. But, beloved, remember ye the words that were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How that they told you there should be mockers when? In the last time. Who should walk after their own ungodly lust? They're not walking for the Lord. They're walking for their lust. These be they who, what's it say? Sensual, having not the Spirit. Well, preacher, you tell me I'm not saved just because I don't go to church? No, I can't tell you if you are saved if you go to church. I can't, I can't judge that. I'm not wise enough, and I don't see deep enough into your soul. But I'll tell you this. One of the reasons that people will not meet together for the things of God will be because they're sensual and they do not have the Spirit. There's nothing inside them that longs or looks for the things of God. I'm not telling you that everything inside me looks and longs for the things of God. i got a flesh. It fights against the things of God. But I've also got a Spirit, and it really likes the things of God. In Jude... It gives you the problem that some people just will be disclosed, fully realize that they're not a believer. They're not saved. They don't have the Spirit. First John says it like this. They went out from us because they were not of us, for had they been of us, they no doubt would have continued with us. Well, that's not the verse to condemn if you change churches. Ah, they, they're lost. That's why they changed. No, but I'm just telling you this. If you don't go to a church there's probably a reason you don't go. Well, I had a really bad experience. Maybe so. I believe it. Bad experiences happen at church and schools and governments yeah. and politicians yeah. and cars yeah. and doctors and hospitals. Yeah. Anybody ever had a bad, a bad experience at a doctor's hospital? Yeah. Or a dentist. Can somebody say amen? Now, we have some chiropractors in the church, so there's never anything wrong that happens at a chiropractor office. But these other ones, all oh, these things happen all the time. It's the same as in church. The point of you going to church will be to be intentional. And I'm preaching to the choir. You need to save this message and send it to someone who didn't go to church, right, preacher? No, I need to provoke us because there'll be a day and a time when we don't want to go as well. We're human. It happens. The Bible says, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but even more as you see the day approaching. Well, I'm so glad we had church Wednesday night. Amen. Fella came, got saved at the end of service. Yeah. Rejoicing, awesome. Well, I'm glad we had. I'm glad that I'm glad people had church when I got saved on a, on a Sunday, Wednesday night. Look, you and I. I'm not. I'm not trying to fill some ministry position. We're not lacking in in some field that I'm trying to get you prepped to sign you up to serve at. That, 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 that's November when we talk about offerings. Amen. That's not this. Yeah, that's yeah. Not, I, I'm not talking specific. I'm just telling you that the verse here says that we ought not to forsake, and the reason is is our faith, our full assurance, our progress. And if we're not, what fear or what are we feeling free from the need of and the duty of? Some, some uh, messages and sermons and speeches are given way ahead of their time. This one is given way before its time. This book was written 2,000 years ago. When, when church was the only social gathering of the whole community. They didn't have anything else to go to. They probably didn't need to preach about it much because everybody's going to go to so they can see everybody else there. But yet it is exactly what this generation and what this church needs to hear. Amen. Preacher, you're trying to make us feel bad. No, I'm trying to provoke you because one day you will feel bad when you're standing in line. And you've been saved by grace. You're going to heaven just because of the blood of Christ. But then you've got to give an account right in front of or right behind all these others that had the same verse 
the same, worse fears, more obstruction, more hindrance, and yet Paul said, I've fought a good fight, I've kept the faith. Listen, if you're not sure you're saved today, I hope you'll get saved, man. Why would I want to get saved and sign up for this? Who wants Bobby Knight as their preacher? No, you need to get it because it's true. And if you'll call upon the name of the Lord, you'll come on bend the knee. Christ will save you free of charge and free of any expectation. But if you'll follow him and you'll submit to him, you'll find the joys of the Lord are wonderful and they're fulfilling. And it's the path that you need to partake in for this life. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word today. I thank you for the willingness to come and worship together. God, I'm not